Hundreds of people go missing under baffling conditions in the woods of North America every year. I'm talking about people that are right in front of their loved ones and then in an instant they're just gone. Or in other cases, people disappear and then are found again in places that are seemingly impossible to get to. One former police detective named David Politis has investigated thousands of these strange disappearances and he documents what he finds in his incredible book series called Missing 411. Today, we're gonna take a look at three missing 411 cases that even amongst strange disappearances, these rank as particularly bizarre. But before we get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right channel because that's all we do and we upload three or four times every week. So if that's of interest to you, please send a memo around to the entire office giving everybody a paid afternoon off, except for the like button. Tell them they have to stay back and mind the phones. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. On June 23, 1963, seven-year-old Bruce Farron, along with his aunt, uncle, and cousins, began the two-mile hike into the Uinta Mountain Range in Utah. They were headed for Pyramid Lake, where they planned to do some camping for a couple of days. After they arrived, they decided they would head down to the water to cool off. But right before they got in the water, Bruce told his aunt and uncle that he needed to use the bathroom. And so his family got into the water and Bruce walked over to a grove of trees and bushes to relieve himself. After a couple of minutes, Bruce did not come out of the wood line. And so his aunt and uncle started yelling for him. He didn't come out again. And so the uncle walked up and walked into the trees to go find his nephew, but he was not there. And so his uncle starts yelling for his nephew, but he's nowhere to be found. And so he yelled back for his wife and his kids to come help him look. And for the next hour, they searched the entire area yelling for Bruce, but there was no sign of him. So they contacted the authorities. That day, a huge search was launched for Bruce, but just like his family, nobody could find any trace of him. The following day at 4 p.m., Bruce had still not been located. And at this point, his family is starting to lose hope. And it was around that time that a searcher who was several miles away from where Bruce had last been seen was walking up this very steep trail heading up towards this cliff. And the searcher knew this cliff was 500 feet and there was no way a child could climb up it or down it. And so he was about to turn around and go search somewhere else when he happened to look up and he saw a child walking down the trail towards him and the child was Bruce and Bruce was totally fine, albeit a little bit hungry. According to David Politis, all of these search and rescue models that predict where missing people will end up after they go missing say that boys aged seven to nine will be found within a 7.2 mile radius 95% of the time, and that distance could be covered over a week's time. In order for Bruce to be found where he was, he would have needed to cover 20 miles along a rugged ridgeline before scaling down that 500 foot cliff without the aid of climbing gear, and he did all that within 30 hours, a seemingly impossible task for a missing seven-year-old boy. When asked what happened, Bruce said he didn't remember. He didn't understand why or how he had gotten lost in the first place. The only things he remembered were sleeping between two downed logs and drinking from a waterfall and many animals, including one that was so close to him at night that it would jump over him. Bruce was followed up with as he got older, but he never could regain the memory of what actually happened to him. Some have speculated that Bruce might have been abducted when he went to the bathroom, and that's the only way he was able to cover that great of a distance in that amount of time, that his abductor basically physically moved him at least part of the way, and that perhaps his abductor was one of these animals he saw at night. In 2007, Barbara Bullock was a 55-year-old, fit, happy, healthy woman living in Montana with her husband of 14 years. In July of that year, her husband's cousin named Donna and Donna's boyfriend named Jim Rawmaker came to stay with them for a couple of days. On the evening of the 17th, Barbara offered to take the couple hiking with her the following morning at her favorite hiking spot, which was this totally unspoiled wilderness area on the border of Idaho. Barbara liked to hike a particular trail that brought her up to the Bear Creek Overlook that had this incredible view down to the valley below. The couple happily agreed, but the following morning, Donna was not feeling so good, so she couldn't go on the hike. 
but her boyfriend, Jim, was still feeling up for it and said, I'd still like to go. And so he and Barbara wound up doing the hike on their own. At 1.30 that afternoon, Barbara's husband got a phone call from a police officer saying his wife was missing. And her husband just couldn't understand that. Barbara hiked in that area all the time and she had been with Jim, so where could she have gone? But the police officer didn't have a great answer and he just told him, you should come down here and hear Jim's explanation about what happened. When Barbara's husband arrived at the park, he rolled right up next to the officer and Jim. He got out and Jim, who was in total shock, began to explain what happened. He and Barbara had made it up the trail successfully to the Bear Creek Overlook. They'd stayed up there for about 30 minutes. They had a picnic and they were enjoying the scenery. And then at the end of it, they packed up and Barbara began walking down the very well-marked trail. And she was about 20 feet ahead of him when he decided to turn around and take one more look at the beautiful view. And he said he was looking at the view for about 40 seconds before he turned back around and Barbara was gone. And he hadn't heard her call out for help. He hadn't heard her fall. There was no sound of other people. There was no sound of other animals. There was no sound of any struggle whatsoever. It was just complete eerie silence. And as he took a few steps down the trail, he said he started looking around expecting to just see her behind a tree or something, but she was nowhere. And as he walked, he noticed that the ground underneath every step made a lot of noise because there was lots of loose rocks and shale all over the ground. And so he stopped and he's listening really intently to see if he can hear where Barbara's gone, but he doesn't hear anything. And he's thinking, how could she have gotten away from me without me hearing the sound of her footsteps? And then he also began looking around and realized the area they were in, this trail, it was well trafficked. And so it was not very densely forested. You could actually see a pretty good distance in all directions because there was enough space between the trees. And so he's looking around thinking there's almost nowhere to hide. And so Jim started to feel scared and just began walking down the trail, expecting to run into her at any moment, but he didn't and he kept turning around and looking behind trees and rocks and he's thinking, you know, this is impossible. I should have seen her, I should see her now. Where could she have possibly gone? And so he made his way all the way down the trail the whole time turning around and looking for her and yelling for her but never getting any feedback from her. And he got all the way to the parking lot and he saw her car was still parked in the parking lot. And he's looking around the parking lot, she's not out there. And he noticed a crew was working in the road. And he went up to them and he asked if they had seen her or anybody come out of that trail. And they said no. And so Jim's starting to panic and he ran right back up the trail, all the way back up to the Bear Creek Overlook, hoping that along the way he would see some indication of where she went. But again, there was nothing on the trail. He gets up to the Overlook, he's looking around, he's yelling for her, nothing. And so he ran right back down again and he contacted authorities. Over the next 48 hours, a huge search was launched all around this area for Barbara. It included helicopters and huge search teams and highly trained sniffing dogs, but nothing was found. There was no signs of foul play. There was no signs of an animal attack or some sort of abduction. There was nothing, not even her scent was found. Despite the fact that the dog's handlers knew exactly where her last position was, but none of the dogs picked it up, which is highly unusual. It really was like she had vanished into thin air. At first, Jim was obviously a suspect because he was the last person to see Barbara alive, but he never changed his story despite how far-fetched it seemed, and he was very cooperative and was very quick to offer to take a polygraph test, and so the police ruled him out as a suspect. And shortly after the search started, they shut it down because there was no sign of this woman anywhere. And so unfortunately, her family had to face the awful reality of getting zero closure. She was just gone and nobody knew what happened. And unfortunately, to this day, we still don't know what happened because no trace of Barbara has ever been found. In 1910, 23-year-old Orville Tuttle worked as a locomotive engineer in Whitehall, Montana. While he loved his job and loved cars, his real passion was hunting. His friends would describe him as being a fearless hunter, a crack shot, and very cool under pressure. In October of that year, Orville, along with his younger brother and his cousin, headed off to a river valley just outside of Yellowstone National Park to do some hunting. When they got there, they made their way into the forest, they found a decent clearing, they brushed off some snow, and they set up their camp 
campsite. They stayed up for a bit around the campfire that night, but everybody went to bed early. The following morning, Orville was the first one to wake up, and while he was outside of the campsite, he noticed some elk tracks that had passed by in the night. And so he woke up his brother and cousin and told them he was going to go and track this animal for no longer than about an hour. The two men said that was fine. They knew Orville was a very accomplished outdoorsman, and so they weren't worried about him. An hour later, the brother and the cousin were now awake, and they were sitting around the fire waiting for Orville to return, but he didn't. The men waited another hour, and another hour, and another hour, and still Orville never showed up. And this whole time, the men are considering, should we go out and go looking for him? And every time they'd stand up to go begin their search, they'd say, you know what? I'm sure he's fine. We're overreacting. And they'd sit back down again. But by nightfall, when they still had not seen Orville or heard from him, the pair was starting to get really nervous. And so they decided they would go to bed and Orville was bound to turn up in the middle of the night. Early the next morning, the two men got up hoping to see Orville, but he had not returned. And so the two men left the forest. They got two more family members to come back with them. And then the four of them began a search for Orville. And very quickly, they found Orville's tracks leading out of the camp, meandering their way through this very thick forest and through all the snow, all the way down to this very shallow river that at its deepest point was no higher than your ankle. Orville's tracks stopped at the edge of this river and continued for three miles walking away from the campsite right alongside this river until they stopped in this little clearing in the snow where there was a very small campfire set up but the logs and the kindling in the campfire had not been burned. And so the search party figured that Orville, when he got here, must have had wet matches or something because he couldn't get the fire going. And then from the campfire, they continued to follow Orville's tracks a little bit farther down the river until they turned and walked directly into this very shallow river. And then from there, the search party looked for miles and miles and miles downstream and upstream, and they never found any tracks leaving the river, even though alongside the entire river on both sides was plenty of snow. So anybody who walked into the river and then walked out again would leave tracks but there were no more tracks. As it started to get dark and they still had not found any sign of Orville, one of the men left the forest and contacted authorities who launched a formal search. The sheriff's department, along with hundreds of volunteers, descended into this area where Orville got lost. And they started by searching even farther downstream and upstream of this river to see if they could find where Orville stepped out of the river, but they too couldn't find any tracks. And so for a couple of days, they searched this river and the surrounding forest, but there was just no sign of Orville. Then on the third evening of the search, one of the searchers was up in the mountains in an area that was relatively close to the last area where Orville had tracks in the snow. And the searcher saw there was a little campfire that had been set up in the middle of nowhere. He walked up to it and he saw it had been recently extinguished. It was still warm. And next to this fire was a pair of boots but there was no person anywhere in the vicinity. And then the searcher noticed there were tracks leaving this campfire and these tracks were made with bare feet. And so the searcher just began following these tracks. And so the searcher went up a mountain. He went down the other side, down into this deep ravine. And then he stopped because he's looking straight ahead of him and it's another mountain going straight up. And that's where the tracks continue to go. And it's very thickly forested and it's starting to get dark. And so he's thinking to himself, you know, is it a good idea to just continue walking on my own or should I go back and get some help? And so as he's weighing out what he should do next, he catches movement out of his peripheral vision and he kind of glances up into the mountain right ahead of him and he sees this dark figure kind of slowly moving up the mountain quite a ways away from him. But from his perspective, even though he doesn't have a good view, it looks like a man. And so if it's a man walking up this hill, it's probably the same guy that left that campfire and therefore is leaving these barefoot tracks up this mountain. And so the searcher thinks that's got to be Orville. Something's wrong with him. You know, who knows what's going on with him, but I got to get his attention. And so the searcher yells out to this guy to try to get him to stop. But even though he was clearly in earshot, this guy just did not stop moving. He just methodically continued moving up the mountain. And so the searcher is confused at why this person wouldn't stop. And so he pulls out his pistol and fires three shots into the air, which is like the universal stop what you're doing and turn around. But again, this figure, this person, this guy didn't stop. They didn't react, no flinching. They just kept moving up and over the top of the mountain and out of sight. 
And so now the searcher's thinking to himself, you know, what did I just see? Who is that? What were they doing out here? And he's thinking, you know what? It's too dark. I can't just continue up this mountain towards whoever this is. I gotta go back. And so the searcher marked where he was, turned around, and he ran back to the search party and he told them what he had seen. And they said, okay, well, we'll go looking tomorrow. And so the next morning early, this huge search party gets to that ravine where he marked that spot. But at this point, so much snow had fallen, all the tracks of this barefoot man who was walking around the night before have all been covered up. And so despite doing a very extensive search with a lot of people in that area, they couldn't find any trace of the shoeless man. Many believe the shoeless man was Orville. And in fact, the local newspapers at the time speculated as much. But if it was Orville, why didn't he turn around when someone was yelling his name or when multiple gunshots were fired into the air? And where was he going walking barefoot in a snowstorm in the middle of the night? Others have speculated this was not Orville, that it was some other person or some other creature lurking around the woods at night and that perhaps they had something to do with whatever happened to Orville. But regardless of who or what that figure was, no one ever found any traces of Orville or the Shoeless Man ever again. So that's gonna do it, guys. If you wanna learn more about the Missing 411 phenomenon, I would encourage you to check out the official YouTube page of Missing 411. It's called the Can-Am Missing Project. That's David Pilatus' official and only YouTube page. I would also encourage you to go to canammissing.com where you can purchase all of the Missing 411 books as well as check out their documentaries and all this information is linked in the description below. If you wanna get in touch with me, you can direct message me on Instagram or on Twitter. My username for both platforms is the same. It's John Ballin. 416. I also have a ton of content over on TikTok where my username is Mr. Ballin. I also have a second YouTube channel called Mr. Ballin Shorts where I post random short videos and lost episodes. If you have a story suggestion, please submit it to our subreddit just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked in the description below. So whether I see you on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, or some combination, just know that I really appreciate your support. And until next time, that's going to do it. See ya.